I think the band just preached my sermon. <laughs> well, good morning. I'm Rusty Roten, also known as Becky's dad. Uh, you can call me by either name because if raising our three kids in the Lord with Sharon, my wife, were the only accomplishment that, of my life, then it would be worth it all. Pastor Tony has asked me to speak this morning so that we can get to know each other a little bit better, and I'm excited and humbled to be chosen recently as an elder to help shepherd this body. And uh, although I've been involved in, in several local churches over the years, I really like it here. <laughs> um, I've served in various functions and served as a deacon, but I've never, never really served in, or never really spoken to a church congregation, at least in this manner before. So bear with me. Uh, with the Lord's help and with your patience, we can hopefully bring honor to our Savior. A little background. Sharon and I will be married. I'm sorry. We are married, of course. Sharon and I will be celebrating. <laughs> Nobody laughed in the first service. But, uh, Sharon and I will be celebrating 45 years of marriage this year. When we met, I just knew she was the one for me. She was singing in church. I, I just knew it. She just didn't know it yet, but I just knew it. And once we began to talk, you know, I just realized what a, what a masterful grasp of the scripture she really had. It impressed me. I mean, she, she liked to quote Paul. Oftentimes she would say to me, I would not have you ignorant, brother. It, it was sharper than a two-edged sword, but it didn't really deter me. She's been my life partner now for a long time, from my youth. And as we grow older together, we grow more in love each day. We came to FBCW after previously being at another church for nearly 22 years. And leaving there was difficult for sure, but really having the blessing of my daughter and son-in-law and my five, soon to be six, grandsons, I love them. It just made sense to be here. We continue to hear the gospel here, and, and that, was, that was a big draw, preached every week. Uh, it solidified our decision to unite with you last year. After we joined, we both wanted to be involved, but we never imagined that it would lead to a call to eldership. It's been very humbling to me. I've been privileged to hear several of our laymen and ladies speak, and they've all been excellent in their conveying of their heart for Jesus. I mean, just last Sunday... Josh Clore masterfully presented undeniable truths of the life of our crucified and risen Savior through the historical record of the Old Testament prophecies. Non-Christian writers who documented the facts and, of course, the words of Christ himself. If taken together honestly, they leave no room for doubt about the historical Jesus. In light of it all, our response to him is all that's left to do. So again, I'm a little intimidated as I stand here before you today and uh, after hearing the, such great proclamations of the gospel message. So before we move further, let's have a word of prayer. Sovereign Lord, thank you for this day, this body of believers, and the freedom to gather to praise you and speak your word. May you receive glory this morning as we worship you in spirit and truth from our hearts. Lord Jesus, please hide me behind your cross as your word is presented, that you would have the supremacy in our hearts and minds this morning. 
Give us understanding and application as your Holy Spirit directs each of us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to tell you some, some of my background and how it relates to the gospel. Once I've told you, we'll conclude with an opportunity for you to respond however the Lord leads you. But first, I've got a story for you and a question. Have you ever heard the saying describing a person as being so heavenly minded there are no earthly good? I'm sure you have. Well, one evening, a little church had a special speaker. And he was expounding upon the glories of heaven in glowing terms. He paused and asked, who all would like to go to heaven? Many hands went up, heads were nodding, and but he noticed down front there was a little boy that just, he just sat there. He went on telling an even more elaborate descriptions of the streets of gold, the crystal sea, the new Jerusalem. Again, he paused and asked, who all wants to go to heaven? This time, practically every hand went up, but the little boy just sat down front. He didn't respond as the rest had. So once again, the preacher this time, he really laid it on thick, creating word pictures of the throne of God, the 24 elders, the seraphim, the cherubim. He could see how he had, he, you know, he had the crowd. And he was, they were marveling at the thought of heaven. And at the height of his crescendo, he asked, who all is ready to go to heaven? Hands went up, people stood up, people shouted. There was dancing. Obviously, it wasn't a Baptist church, but, but again, the preacher noticed a little boy down front just looking around, but he just sat there. Finally, the preacher turned a little exasperated to the boy and asked, son, don't you want to go to heaven? The boy looked up at him and said, well, of course I do, but I thought you was getting up a load for tonight. So, you know, really... I realize more and more that we have much to do on this earth. And we're here as the body of Christ to fulfill what Christ would have us do. There's a whole world of people that are lost without Jesus. He told us that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. His last words to us on earth in the Great Commission of Matthew 28 gave us a mandate, <clears throat> a mission, and a message to make disciples of all peoples. Now, certainly there's nothing wrong with studying and learning and about what the Bible says about heaven because it, it will be glorious. But we'll have an eternity to discover what God has planned for those who love him. In the meantime, time is short relatively speaking. There's work to do, but we're not left alone. Jesus promised to be with us to the very end of the age. Now, when I was in first grade, my dad, also known as Big Jim, took me out to where the Summersville Dam was being constructed. I don't remember exactly why we went, but I was excited to go, especially I could just be with my dad. From the vantage point that he chose, I was fascinated by the buzz of work, the sounds, and even the smells. I saw an array of large earth-moving equipment. You don't find them on the highway. <clears throat> there were humongous dump trucks called ukes, large earth scrapers known as pans that reminded me of big yellow caterpillars the way they articulated their way across the rough terrain. There was bulldozers, graders, cranes, and so many others. And their size dwarfed the men working around them. You know, it was a boy's dream come true. Tonka toys had come to life right in front of me. <laughs> I have a sense now why <clears throat> Dad took me there that day. See, Dad started pursuing a course of study to become an engineer. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, today if someone uh, 
you know, has, if someone doesn't have time to go to a college or university campus, they can take courses online. Well, back then, there certainly wasn't an online access. Not until Al Gore invented the internet, but that's a different story. <laughs> but there were correspondence courses for engineering, which dad was working toward after he returned home from World War II. In fact, I still have some of his drafting tools. However, with a wife and a growing family, mouths to feed, he had to put his pursuits on hold and eventually it was set aside altogether in order to earn a living. First as a traveling salesman and then later in the grocery store business <clears throat> at which he became very successful in the days before the, the big box superstores. I was privileged to work with dad at the store along with my siblings. I saw his integrity in business. How he, how he treated customers and employer, employees alike. Sometimes I'd see him at home as well, how he loved mom, even in difficult times. Saw him at the Baptist church we attended. Same consistent man who lived out his faith in the Lord. Now when my time came one evening in church to place my faith, in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Hearing about a Father in heaven who loved me despite who I was, what I'd done, had already been modeled for me by Dad. Here, go again. <laughs> so receiving Christ upon finally understanding the gospel message <clears throat> was really, really an easy decision for me at age 12. And I know that everybody here is not fortunate enough to have a father like my dad. Don't let that rob you of knowing a heavenly father who loves you and seeks the very best for you. But sometimes... I'm sorry, but something about being at that construction site that day with my dad stirred something within me that has stayed with me to this day. A longing to somehow be involved in building things. After high school, I went off to engineering school in Morgantown, and though I didn't burn any couches, I, uh, I, I struggled, but I finally got my uh, civil engineering degree. And immediately, I mean within a month, began working for the West Virginia Department of Highways in the district bridge office in Parkersburg. So I guess building dams was not to be, but bridges, well, they became very special to me. Although I was part of designing and building new ones, much of my bridge career was applied to repairing and restoring and renovating older st structures to allow their continued use and safe passage for the traveling public. You know, it just recently, the events in the news regarding the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in, uh, in Baltimore reminded me of <clears throat> the Silver Bridge collapse in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in December of 67. I was just a boy, but I remember it had an impact upon me. But these tragedies serve as a stark reminder that even man's best efforts can be flawed. Because man is fallible, so his creative work is susceptible to it as well. So bridges and later highway work in general became my life's work for nearly 42 years. Can you believe that? Somebody stayed in the same job for 42 years? <laughs> In West Virginia, you know, the terrain is full of obstacles that historically have hindered or prevented easy travel. There's mountains, rivers, deep valleys, gorges, chasms. To me, it's a wonderful thing to see an untraversable chasm or barrier 
become, or this that prevents going from here to there, to see it become transformed and become accessible, easily crossed, almost as if the chasm didn't exist by bridging a great divide. Well, you know, that premise brings a parallel in my mind with what God has done in an eternal scale through his son on, on the cross. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. And our sin has made a separation between us and God. Isaiah 59.2 in the New English translation says, but your sinful acts have alienated or separated you from your God. Your sins have caused him to reject you and not listen to your prayers. In fact, we all start out as sinners by nature and by choice. How can we ever overcome such a separation? We can't. But God has provided a bridge through Christ's death on the cross. Holy God took the initiative to reach sinful man through his one and only son, Jesus. I realize statistically, perhaps most of us here today are already Christians. But to me, the gospel never gets old and is applicable to all of us, especially if there's one friend or family member among us that's lost. The gospel is truly good news for all mankind. In fact, that's what the Greek word means. But you really cannot appreciate the good news without understanding the bad news first. We can't see our personal need for this bridge to eternal life with God until we're standing on the edge of the chasm, staring into the dark void. We may catch a glimpse of the promised land or, or hear about the promised land across the way. That place we call heaven that includes eternal life with God. It's on the other side of the chasm, though. That's when the realization of our hopelessness hits us. Sinful man can't build a bridge to holy God. No matter how, how he may try to impress God with so-called good works and behavior. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Again, in Romans 3.20, Paul writes, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Law may be beneficial to show you your sin, and it is, but it cannot save you. Diagnosis is not the cure. Without the bridge, that is, without Christ, continuing to do things our own way is just going further and further astray from God the Father and his eternal will for you. We're all in the same boat. Romans 3, 21, or 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin leads to death, separation from God, both in this life and the eternal separation in hell after our physical death without Christ. A place never meant for us, but a place for the devil and his demons. So without Christ choosing to reject him and living a self-perpetuating, self-focused life that it's futile. It has dire consequences. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death. Without Christ, God will give you what you've earned. <clears throat> the payment for your work resulting, results in the separation, excuse me, results in separation from him to instead be with the devil and his horde. Lost. No hope forever. As tragic 
and dismal as that is to consider, there's still hope as long as we're alive. Hope to cross the bridge to eternal life in Christ. And that hope of eternal life can start right now. We just read the first part of Romans 6, 23. Let's read the whole thing. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of eternal life is through Jesus. That's a living hope, not a hope-so hope. It must be by God's way and be in accordance with his truth, and it must involve our receiving new life. Jesus said it in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. And as we sang this morning, he's the way maker. His father provided the bridge, a way, the only way, via the cross of Jesus to provide forgiveness of all our sins through the shed blood of Christ on our behalf. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 states that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In order to be the way for our salvation, Jesus, the sinless God-man, born of a virgin through through God's Holy Spirit, had to become a sin offering to pay the penalty of the righteous demands of the law for our sins. Only through Christ's atoning sacrifice for us can we become righteous in his sight, righteous and holy in his sight. We become fitted for a holy life here, an eternal life with him forever. Romans 5, 25 states, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Have you crossed that bridge with the waymaker? The world tries to tell you that there are many paths to God. But the Bible doesn't allow for that. There's only one way. Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Jesus gives us enlightenment by his spirit to the truth, the truth of who Jesus is and who we are in him. Jesus says in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Freedom to be who God created you to be. John 8, 36 says, Jesus went on to say, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. No longer a slave to sinful self, but a child of God. Are you living in the truth of the freedom that Jesus came to give you? Free from the bondage of sin. Free from wondering where you'll spend eternity. And free to live as God created you to live in joy and peace. Experiencing the love of the Father every day. Jesus is the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. New life through Christ is ours for the asking, but the Bible says you must be born again or born from above. Just like Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How? That's the same question Nicodemus had. Through repentance and confession and faith. Repentance. Turning from our sin. Not just feeling sorry for it. That may be part of it, but that's not enough. Purpose in our heart before God to do an about face. And be willing to change our direction from living for sin and self to living for God through Jesus. Confess to God that we're sinners. Reach out in faith to God. 
If you'll take one step toward him in truth and, and sincerity of heart, confessing your lost state, he promises to run toward you, save you, forgive you, fill you with his Holy Spirit to empower you to live for him all the days of your life, setting your feet on a pathway through life that is meaningful and purposeful, honoring and glorifying to God our Savior. You become a child of the living God with access to the Father's riches in Christ. In fact, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As adopted children of God, we're part of his family, the church, the body of Christ. Saved people being sanctified, set apart daily through yielding and through yielding to and being empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Because with faith in Christ and his resulting work within us, old ways, of, our old ways of living are put off as we put on the new. We've been transformed from a sinner to a saint. Like the old preacher used to say, there's only two kinds of people in the world, saints and ain'ts. <laughs> Some truth in that. We're transformed from death to life eternally, from being under the law to being under grace, from living in self-condemnation to living with no condemnation in Christ Jesus, as Romans 8, 1 tells us. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All the work has been accomplished through his work on the cross. God eagerly awaits us to decide for him, to place our faith where God placed our sin in his son who suffered a horrific death, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. He was buried and on the third day he rose bodily, conquering sin, death, the grave, sealing the ultimate fate of Satan and his demonic followers. Jesus said it shed his blood for us because he loves us. As John 3.16 tells us. Everybody knows that verse. But in Romans 5.8 it says God demonstrated. You know it's one thing to love somebody. It's another thing to act on it. God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, but just like if your bank account was suddenly gifted overwhelmingly with an incredible abundance of funds just for you, it does you or no one else any good unless and until you take the initiative to draw upon that account. The saving power of the blood of Jesus is available to us by faith. Blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins as the old hymn says. Why would anyone neglect so great a salvation? But sadly, they do. Today, if you're not a Christian, haven't drawn from that blood account of Jesus, you cannot work your way to God. <clears throat> no matter how many times you've been baptized, nor how many acts of service you've performed, nor how many Sunday school pens you might have earned, or anything else. Hebrews 3.12, I'm sorry, 3.15 tells us, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as the Israelites did in the wilderness. And so they did not enter God's rest. God's rest symbolized by Canaan, the promised land. They did not enter God's rest because of their disobedience through disbelief. That is, no faith. We can, um, we can call on Jesus today by faith and be saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Today is the day of salvation. And this present moment is really all we're guaranteed. So please don't wait until it's too late if you don't know Christ. We put up so many barriers to coming to God when he's made the way clear by building a bridge to you. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. What's holding you back from laying down your burdens and crossing that bridge? The way maker wants to carry you across to a heavenly father that loves you just as you are, but also created you for a special purpose on this earth that can only become a reality through yielding, surrendering your whole self into the hands of the all-wise, all-powerful, ever-loving, sovereign God of the universe. That's the gospel. That's the good news. But really, it's like the Mercy Me song says. It's not good news. It's the best news ever. Maybe you're a Christian, and the Holy Spirit has been impressing something upon your heart that you need his help with. A sin that you've been harboring, tolerating. A family member, a friend, co-worker that you know you've offended. Or a sense that the Lord is calling you to a deeper commitment, deeper level of commitment to his will. In whatever way the Spirit may be gently prodding you this morning, whether you're a Christian or not, please yield yourself to him. He won't force himself. He loves you and only wants to work his perfect will into your life. Would you pray with me?